The commission that our Lord Jesus left us with is very simple and straightforward. It was to make disciples, to make followers of him, of all people, of all ethnicities, everywhere. And he told us how to do this, baptizing them and teaching them to obey his commands. Basically what that means is converting them and then teaching them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He promised that when the Holy Spirit came upon us, and this is in Acts 1.8, we read this, that they would receive power, that we would receive power to be witnesses in all places. You put these two together, it's very, very clear that we are called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ, to be in the process of reaching all people, of all places, all ethnicities, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was his commission. That's why he came. That's what he left us with. Those were his commands. Those were his charges. That is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, that we now have. So we're talking about sharing our faith today. I love what Dewey said, that he's having another kid to help church grow. That's great. (laughs) If you're not going to share your faith, have a bunch of kids. But if not, and even then, we should be sharing our faith. We are told in Romans 10, 14 and 15, that uh, how will they believe if they don't hear? And how are they going to hear unless someone tells them? And blessed are the feet that those who bring the good news. In the church, there are evangelists. That's the gifts of the Spirit. One of those gifts is evangelists. There are some people that are empowered mightily by the Holy Spirit for that very purpose. However, the job is not just theirs. In fact, Paul says, all those gifts, the the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, are there for a purpose of equipping the saints for the works of service to the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, those people aren't just the doers. They are the equippers for everyone to be involved in the doing. And that includes sharing our faith. So that's what we're looking at today. Uh, Individually, being a disciple, part of that involves being a witness for Jesus Christ. And so we ask the question today, how are we doing with that? The average church, even the average evangelical church, when asked, has to confess, they generally, most of them, are not doing very well. We ask them about church growth, and they'll talk about having kids. Or, more commonly, transfers from other churches that are already believers. But not all that many who are really coming to know Jesus Christ through the witness of the people. Yet, it was Jesus' commission to us to, as we are going, be making disciples. As we are given the Spirit, we're empowered to be His witnesses to everyone. And I think the first thing we need to be reminded of is the urgency of this. The truth of the gospel is there is a heaven and there is a hell. Although the modern church, the more liberal church, likes these days to kind of soft pedal and downplay and even sometimes deny the reality of hell, Jesus spoke about it more than anybody else in the Bible. If you like what Jesus said, you you better pay attention to what he said about eternity. And Jesus also tells us that he didn't come to judge, which people love to hear because the accusation for many Christians is being too judgmental. But if you read what he really says, this is in John chapter 3, right after that that wonderful verse that we all know and most of us have memorized, John 3.16. He said, I didn't come into the world to judge the world because the world stands judged already. I came to save an already judged world. That's why God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish like they're already destined to do, but have eternal life. By the way, that's the gospel. That's salvation. For salvation, you have to be saved from something. You're just not going from a fine existence to a wonderfully fine existence. That's not salvation. That's just improvement. 
Salvation is when you are done, you are cooked, you are damned. And I don't use that as the cuss word, the real meaning of the word. And in the midst of that, God comes and says, but here's a chance. Here is hope. Here is salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. We have to understand that urgency. These people that are walking around us, our neighbors, our co-workers, our fellow students uh, that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ are walking dead. And we have the words of life. That's the biblical reality. If you believe what Jesus taught, that is what he taught. They stand judged already unless they believe in Jesus Christ. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 16 through 21. This is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. Here's what he says. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning with 16. Therefore, from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us to himself. There was a broken relationship with God and humanity. And all of humanity stands under his judgment. Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge because you're already judged. And for this world that stands under the judgment, under the wrath of God, through Christ, we've been reconciled. We've been brought back. The other word is redeemed that we hear so often in Scripture. Namely, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's the forgiveness we have by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now when Paul says we, he's not talking about some apostolic ministry group. He's speaking to a church of regular people in Corinth. And he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He said, this is how we view things now. You're either reconciled to God or you're not. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we beg those who need to be reconciled to be reconciled to God. Do you have that passion? Do you see that urgency? Do you see that the world is dying eternally, which, by the way, makes physical death nothing, and that we have the cure? And we have as much time left as they have days in their lives which may be not many. Do you see the urgency? We appeal, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God who made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the gospel. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. The Bible tells us he bore our sin. It also tells us he became our sin so that when he died, he paid the penalty for our sin. We are no longer under the wrath of God because the price has been paid. The wages of sin is death. He died for us. That's the gospel. By the way, in modern theologies, there's a big movement to move away from this substitutionary atonement where someone else died for our sins because they don't like the concept of sin, really. Yet this is everything the Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to. All those animals had to die and shed blood for their forgiveness because it was all pointing toward Jesus Christ, who would be the ultimate sacrifice. He who knew no sin, he became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Because of that, we have the ministry of reconciliation. We beg you, be reconciled to God. So how are you doing with that? You know, it's interesting when we talk about sharing our faith, most people will say legitimately, 
I need some help here. I, I, need, I need some classes in this. I need some training. I need to know how to do this. And I will say this, that, that's legitimate. We do, we, we need some help. But first of all, the first thing you have to know is understand the gospel, which is, is right here. Do you get it? Do you understand that? Are you studiers of the gospel? Do you review the gospel? Do you dwell on the gospel? Do you know who Jesus is and what he's done? The gospel really is Jesus. You say the gospel is about Jesus. No, the gospel is Jesus. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just a few pages back in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So it's all about Jesus. It is Jesus. Here's, here's the gospel. He died for our sins. That's exactly what we just read, by the way, in 2 Corinthians, right? He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. That's salvation. So Basically, he died for our sins according to the scripture. In other words, you want to know what all that means? Look and see what, what scripture says it means. That he was buried, he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. He died for our sins, a perfect sacrifice. Proved it by rising from the dead. By the way, there's some historicity here. This is not a myth. It's not a story. This really happened. It goes on to say, then he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, although some have fallen asleep. The historical truth of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection are the basis of the gospel. That really happened. People say, well, that's all mythological. You can't believe what the Bible says. Well, how did these people change? Why did these people go from frightened, running away to giving their lives as martyrs, which 11 of the 12 apostles did. The other one was imprisoned. What made that change? What started this thing called the church that 2,000 years later is pervasive all over the globe and has been? The reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we need to have a firm grasp of that to be able to share it. But you know, we can get into all kinds of apologetics and all kinds of arguments, say, well, in sharing your faith, people don't trust the scriptures, they have all these philosophical arguments, and they don't believe in God, and it's a complex world, and science rules today. And you know, If you are really into these things, and if you are intellectually inclined, go do your reading, do your research. There's excellent books you can read and learn how to argue apologetically with people, learn how to argue philosophically. But let me tell you something, from my experience, those arguments are interesting and they make you feel pretty good about, well, I defended the gospel well, but they very seldom lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it all becomes philosophical. It all becomes theological. It all becomes whatever ickle you want to say. <laughs> but what is really powerful is the very presence of the living Christ in one's life. So let me go to the best training on how to share your faith we have in the scripture. It's a simple beggar who was born blind in John chapter 9. Turn with me please there. John chapter 9, the Gospel of John. One of my favorite stories in all of scripture. John 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, you need to know the theological presuppositions of that day and age were if something like this, a birth problem, birth defect, was considered the result of sin. Okay, that happened because somebody sinned. You sin, God's going to do that to you. That was their rather bad theology in those days. So the disciples asked him, verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. By the way, this is a wonderful, wonderful verse to give to parents who have had a child who was born with some 
malperfections of some kind. You know, we've had some like that. Our twins were born with some issues. And one of the things that always goes through your mind, even though you know better, is, wow, what did I sin? Is this a result of my sin? And okay, we're down to Shrine Hospital with them many times, and there was one lady at the Shrine Hospital that Karen talked to that had a, a daughter that had some very serious stuff. And this, this lady was just in, in despair because she was convinced that she watched a movie that she shouldn't have watched when she was pregnant. And because of that, her daughter was born this way. Well, that's about as bad a theology as you can possibly have. But some people struggle with that. And this is a great verse for that. When Jesus says, no, this is not about sin. This child was born this way that God might be glorified in him. And so, if you read on down through that passage, he spits on the ground, makes mud out of the dust, puts it on this person's eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he goes and washes out his eyes, and this man who was blind from birth now sees. Therefore, uh, the neighbors, verse 8, those who previously saw him as beggar were saying, is this not the one who used to sit and beg? And others were saying, it is he. Still others were saying, no, but it's like him. And he kept saying, I am the one. The story gets more comical as we go along, by the way. So they were saying to them, how then were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who's called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now, here's the kicker. It was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees are going, we knew this guy was a sinner. We knew it all along. Verse 15. The Pharisees were asking him again how he received his sight. He said to them, he applied clay to my eyes. I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind men again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, probably with a shrug of his shoulders, he's a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the very one who received his sight. And they questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, the parents said to him, he is of age, ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man's a sinner. And here's your lesson, by the way, in sharing your faith right here. Verse 25. Then he answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. There's our lesson in sharing your faith right there. This simple, blind beggar, who with all these theological arguments of how he must be a sinner because this or that says, I don't know about all that, but I know that I was once blind, and now I see. We can argue theology, we can argue philosophy, we can argue spirituality, but no one can argue with your life and what God has done in it and what the Lord Jesus is doing in it right now, presently. How do you share your faith? The question is, do you have faith? Has your life been transformed by the presence of Jesus Christ? Share that. Do you know him? Share that. Share your life. We don't have to have the canned presentation memorized with all the verses of the Roman road or the little copy of the four spiritual laws or steps to peace with God. Those are all great and, and useful, but they're just a sales pitch. You can't argue with a life. And if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have something to share. 
Share that. The value of the personal testimony. Do you want to do something to better prepare yourself to share your faith? Work on presenting, talking about what God has, doing, has done and is doing in your life. And by the way, if you can't think of anything, then maybe there's a problem a little deeper than that. Maybe you yourself need to go back and see if you believe what you really profess to believe. The most wonderful gospel presentation I find in all scripture is this blind beggar who simply says, I don't know about all these fancy arguments, but I used to be blind, now I see. And these uh, scholarly theologians had no answer for that. You can't argue with your life. By the way, the rest of the story, it just gets better and better. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He told them, he said, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciple too, do you? He got a little snarky there, didn't he? And they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. And by the way, this simple, formerly blind beggar says to them, Well, here's an amazing thing. You do not know how or where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it's never been heard of anyone open the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they said to him, you were born entirely in sins, that bad theology once again, and you are teaching us, and they put him out. I look at this and I say, you know, it's really not that complicated. Sharing your faith is not that complicated. But here's the kicker. You have to have one. You have to have faith. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He has to be working and have worked in your life. And if he does, you've got something to share. Share that. But oh, by the way, you've got to be living it. And the best way to share your faith is to live your faith before these people. Sometimes that means rearranging your life so that you're in proximity to them a little more often so they can see you and get to know you and in such a way see that you know, you're a little strange and different in certain ways that all have to do with faith in Jesus Christ. Peter tells us, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. That's a, that's a verse on sharing your faith. It starts with living it before others. And when the opportunities come, be ready to give an account for the hope that is in you. I used to be blind, but now I see. And it was Jesus who did this. And you can argue whether Scripture is reliable, and you can argue about science, and you can argue about philosophy, and you can argue about who's right of all these different religions. What I know is I used to be blind, but now I see. And the Lord Jesus who you say might be a myth, is living and well in my life, and there's no question about it. And he has changed my life just the way this book says he changes lives. And those that I hang out with have the same story to tell. Explain that one. People can argue about those uh, philosophical things. They cannot argue with your life. So where do we start? We start there. Let's live what we know before others. Let's be ready to give glory to God. Let's know the gospel enough, enough to give simple explanations. And if you're so inclined intellectually, yes, yeah, study it and be ready for the, for the more intellectual arguments. That's great. We need people that can do that too. But every one of us, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a story to tell. Even blind beggars who've been blind since birth who now see because isn't that what we all are when it comes right down to it? Let's pray.